Welcome, everybody. I really appreciate uh, your time and willingness to listen to us uh, for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, my name is Marta Pikarska. I'm Director of Ecosystem for Hyperledger, so I actually work for the Linux Foundation. Uh, and today with me, I have three pretty amazing panelists. Um, so there is Bobby, Sean, and Saptarshi, and I will ask you to introduce yourself and give one fun fact about you. All right. Um, is this on? Yeah. Can you, okay, perfect. Hi, I'm Sean O'Kelly. I'm a um, current head of technology for a reg tech company called MEI, Meetings and Events International in Chicago. Um, and I actually just started that role recently. Uh, but prior to that, I was a department CIO at the state of Illinois for the Department of Financial and Professional Regulation. So um, I'm, I'm very familiar with the um, public sector space. And uh, I've been contributing to Hyperledger now for about two years. Uh, so a uh, little fun fact about me, just over three and a half years ago, um, I joined a group and climbed and summited um, Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. <laughs> <laughs> now you'll get a round of applause for that. <laughs> okay, Bobby, tell Hi, us I'm, something more about yourself. I'm Bobby Mascara, and I'm the director of education for a company called Ledger Academy. And in the Hyperledger world, I am the chair of the Learning Materials Working Group, which tries to gather all of the wonderful work that the community does and put it in a library so people know where it is. A fun fact about me is I am a master gardener, and I am trying to develop a cold hardy crepe myrtle that will live in my home state of New Jersey. So it's a project that I work on every season. Uh, hi. Um, I'll give you this one. Okay. Uh, so I have been contributing to the Hyperledger public sector with Sean and Bobby for the last couple of years. Uh, from Jan this year, I have started uh, chairing this uh, Hyperledger Public Sector SIG with uh, Dr. Hannah Norberg. And uh, we are pretty much pleased to be here in front of you guys. And uh, I also work with Paramount uh, on the Emerging Technology Initiative. And uh, not pretty much fun fact, but I love tracking at least once a year. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. So now if you don't have any other questions, you can always ask our panelists about their fun facts. Um, so uh, as you, Saptarshi, mentioned, uh, this submission, uh, this talk has been put together by uh, participants of the uh, public sector special interest group. So, um, Bobby, maybe to you. Would you tell me a bit more about what is public sector special interest group and in general special interest groups? Well, in the Hyperledger community, community, there's uh, working groups and special interest groups. And it's an online community where if you have an interest in any of these sectors or in the development of those specific working groups um, topics, you can join them and they have calls um, bi-weekly where anyone can join and contribute. Um, the working groups, um, Again, the learning material is an example of the working groups. Um, the special interest groups basically do cross sectors and consortium work. So for public sector, um, I'm just a global citizen. That's why I'm there. Um, Sean has some credibility with the state of Illinois and Saptarshi the same way. Um, we're not experts, but we've been listening um, to the most interesting presentations because for some reason the public sector working group calls get the um, governments and uh, corporations that want to tell us what they're doing. So it's um, interactive insofar as the um, environment and what's happening in public sector today. Thank you. Um, so, Saptarshi, you're the chair, so I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, what are the interesting things that happened in public sector? Like, is this group producing anything yet, even? Uh, we actually started working on a white paper, so Bobby, Sean, Alfonso, Kelly, and uh, some of our folks are working on the white paper. And uh, as Bobby mentioned, we also organize you know, bi-weekly presentation from people all over the world. Uh, like we are focusing right now on creating a database of public sector projects in blockchain independent of whatever technology they're based on, 
and the status of those projects so that you know you guys can have a glimpse of what is the exact progress in public sector whether it's strategies policies or on the implementation side of projects and if there is any values you can gain from them thank you um, by the way, if anybody has questions, we are very open to having the questions all throughout the session. You don't have to wait for the last five minutes or anything like that. Um, so you mentioned white paper. Uh, what are the conclusions of the white paper? Sean, can you tell me? Yeah, so um, throughout the last couple of years as we've been uh, exploring the, the uh, public sector space, um, we, we found that there are four common themes that keep coming up over and over and over again. And so we kind of view the public sector working group, um, it's treated as though it's this monolith, but the truth is is that um, it's almost like a horizontal that touches uh, nearly every industry vertical that is regulated in any way. So we call this the public sector working group, but the truth is is that if you work in a regulated space, which most people do, um, the, the, the public sector uh, touches you in some way. So it doesn't matter if it's financial services, insurance, healthcare, energy, transportation, supply chain, it goes on and on and on and on. And so what we found are the, the, the common themes are this, the four common themes. First is identity. Um, and we think about identity in the broadest sense, uh, and we talk about it in the broadest sense. So it can be the identity of an individual or an entity, uh, an organization, but it can also be the identity of any other thing of value that exists in the real world uh, that you're representing digitally. So it can be a unit of measure of something, like a unit of something that's going through a supply chain. It can be a unit of energy. It could be a, a, a work of art. It could be a currency. It, anything that represents value in the, it could be a, 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 a land record. Uh, of, of, a, of a property. So anything that is represented in the real world, a value, can be represented in the digital world. And it, and it touches the public sector. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first thing. The second thing is generally what we're calling uh, the traceability of interactions. And so what you find over and over again is once you identify something of value, then you, you, th there's usually some public sector requirement to trace that thing through uh, as it transacts over time. So again, doesn't matter in a sense if it's um, a currency or a piece of property or, or units of a, a certain thing in a supply chain, there may be uh, regulatory reasons to have to trace something through. Um, and we generally refer to that as interactions. Uh, now, <clears throat> there's a couple uh, related topics to that as well around interoperability and um, um, uh, the ability to uh, um, uh, interact uh, with, with, with those transactions with APIs. So we can, we can kind of get into that. But <clears throat> that's the basic idea is that the, you, you need some level of traceability. The third concept is uh, the, the concept of regulatory, what we call regulatory compliance, but really it's just a reference to the laws, the rules, administrative rules, other things that happen in the public space that, um, that the, the market participants have to follow. And so the question is, that's really a reference to getting um, those rules and regulations incorporated into a mechanism that allows for the tracing, the traceability that that is usually required in a, regulatory, in a regulated space. Um, and so that, that's referring to the, the governments that are coming up with those rules and regulations. And then finally, the fourth major theme is this concept of governance. Um, and so this is, the, the, the idea of governance is very much in like a, uh, beginning stages. There are organizations out there like the Sovereign Foundation that, are really, that have really put in quite a bit of work around governance, but what they're doing is, is, a, uh, is, is a piece of, of sort of future state blockchain you know, thinking and architecture. I think there's still a lot more work that needs to be done around governance. But the idea with governance is that as, as blockchains evolve and they develop and they, they uh, start operating in the real world, the question is, 
um, you're going to have different roles in that blockchain. You're going to have uh, you're going to have participants that write to the blockchain. You're going to have participants that are reviewers, are verifiers. You you need to build consensus toward things. So as those participants change over time, how do you govern who is allowed to, to play those roles, and and so that there's this ongoing trust in a certain blockchain. So those are at at a, a high level the the four themes that we have found in the public sector over and over and over again. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm now going to challenge you. Prove it to me with use cases. Why are those four teams? Give me something like, you know, with identity, for instance. Bobby, can you tell me what government is doing what, if that's a common theme? Sure. Okay, um, again, with the public sector, um, the phone calls that we're privileged to be a part of, we've heard from the Dutch um, Initiative for Blockchain, um, their approach is government, education, and businesses working together, opening up their records. Because as we all know, public sector has always been the record keeper. Um, the initial issuance of a record or the verification of a record, starting from your birth certificate on all the way through. Basically, your identity is who your government says you are. And if you've listened to any of the information on self-sovereign identity, that's going to change a little bit where you're going to be able to take that back. Um, and governments are playing an important role in opening up their records and must join us um, in that uh, record share and verification process. Um, and the Dutch are leading the um, call on that. And cities like New York and Manhattan, they've had something this summer called the Big Apps Blockchain Challenge, which took three categories, real estate management, energy management, and ID management. And they basically got a room full of blockchain developers and challenged them to come up with solutions because it's a problem in New York. First of all, the mayor ran on a platform that says everyone will have an ID in New York by 2020. New Yorkers don't have driver's license. They don't have IDs other than passports. So that's something they're asking the blockchain um, to help them ID their citizens. And again, it goes through that theme of ID and identifying things goes through all of the public sector blockchain um, initiatives. Great. So, um, sorry. Um, so we have identity. Um, Subtarshi, do you have any use cases uh, on the next level? Specific to identity? Uh, no, to, to on, on the next common theme. Uh, uh, regulation. Which is regulation, yeah. Uh, well, specific to regulations, I would like to point to the fact, not on a use case, but on the common synergy between blockchain and the regulatory environment that's you know evolving with time. So the common regulatory environment that we can think about right now, or which many of us might be aware of, is GDPR. So when GDPR came in you know, execution, people were worried, like what is going to be the future of blockchain with GDPR? Are we going to be compliant with GDPR? Because as per you know, Article 17, you have the right to be forgotten, Article 15 makes you, you know, the data subject, the EU data subject, to be aware of how his data is collected, how it is processed, or if it's being used beyond his knowledge or for some of the purposes. So those were some of the challenges. And again, the question of data ownership. So what blockchain specifically, you know, the Hyperledger Consortium, through the Hyperledger Consortium, and through multiple discussions we had, uh, with our community members in the public sector SIGs, uh, we were able to, you know, come out with some specific pointers uh, that could be compliant with the GDPR. Let's say, uh, I remember the triple blind model, okay? The triple blind model, it's a secure key technology, is one of our community members. So they came up with the concept that, you know, whenever an identity is issued, uh, the attributes, the uh, you know, the entity who's issuing the attributes, they need not know for whom the attribute is issued. The person or the subject, data subject for whom the attribute is issued, do not necessarily need to know who has issued. And comes the third part of the infrastructure player, like Secure Key, IBM, Oracle, or else, uh, who do not necessarily need to know about the entire exchange of attributes. So it's purely compliant with GDPR because you are not taking, extracting data and holding it within your own ambit for some uh, professional or commercial purposes. 
So that is uh, one specific pointer that comes to me. That, that is quite interesting. I, actually, I must say I missed that presentation, so I didn't know that. Um, Sean, do you have any kind of examples of um, use cases that you like or you think that are good? Yeah, I've got maybe a, a couple I'll mention. So the department I worked for at the state, one of the things that it regulates is um, f all, all financial uh, services in the state of Illinois. So that's all, all community banks, credit unions, currency exchanges, payday lending, uh, title insurance, kind of all of it, money transmission. Um, and it also regulates real estate. So, when it, so I'll talk about two different use cases that kind of touch both of those things. In, in real estate, the kind of classic idea is um, you, you have identity and traceability that plays out. Both of, the, both of those things play out in real estate. So you have the identity of the, uh, the, the, the land itself that is under consideration for transaction. Um, and then you have the identity of all of the individuals. You think about all the folks that are involved in a real estate transaction. Right, you have buyer, seller, real estate agents on both sides, lawyers on both sides. You've got appraisers and home inspectors. You've got the lender. You've got um, title insurance, uh, and then eventually, at least in the United States, at the county level, you've got you've got the the recorder, um, and so you've got this whole chain of things that need to be uh, that that uh, where there's identity involved. Um, and then on top of that, you have exchanges of money. So you could argue that, um, that the, the, the funds themselves, whether you want to call them a cryptocurrency or a digital asset, um, th that, that there's an identity component there too. But now you, you, you trace that, those um, real estate transactions over time. That's the traceability piece. And then you also have um, the, the exchange of, of money too. So th that's a classic example of how, um, uh, of how you have identity and traceability kind of happening both at the same time, um, along with a lot of regulation. Obviously, real estate transactions are a fairly regulated space. So um, if anybody's bought a property, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, now, the, the, so how can the blockchain help in, in that kind of a transaction? The idea is someday, in theory, we're not there yet, that uh, you could actually buy a house in a day or two days, all the way through to it being recorded uh, from end to end. Um, you could actually imagine that if you were able to go online and find a house and just buy it. Now, today, it typically takes 30 to 60 days at least for that whole process to play out. I would say that's a minimum of today. Um, and so, so the amount of time that we have to spend to ensure that these things are happening in, a, in the right way um, could, could be significantly reduced. So that's the first example I, I would mention that I, I had direct experience with. Um, the second example is more in lending and financial services. Now, um, in the future, what is anticipated is the concept of peer-to-peer -peer lending. So, so today, if you have to borrow money for, let's just focus on consumer lending, not mortgage lending or other types of lending, just consumer lending. So in other words, if you, if you wanna go buy something, um, uh, a, a TV, um, today you would take out a payday, you know, if you needed to borrow the money, you would use your credit card or you'd use a, you know, even a, a payday loan, I suppose you could use. There, there's different ways to get to, you, can, you have sales finance and you have sort of on, on the spot lending. <clears throat> but that, that is happening um, in a, uh, where, where you're borrowing that money from an institution somewhere. In theory, in the future, you could have what we call peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending where individuals are, are actually lending to that person. Um, it could be done anonymously. I'm not saying people necessarily know who they are. But the, the point is, is that the, if you're sitting in the middle, if you're an institution that's sitting in the middle of those transactions, in theory, someday, that, 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 that may not be as needed as it is today. We use those institutions like community banks and credit unions to help us with trust. Um, but in the future, um, if that can be, if the right transparency and traceability is available uh, through mechanisms like the blockchain, um, that 
th those types of transactions could be done in different ways. And um, so those are two really good examples of how you leverage identity and traceability in, in, in a regulated space. Thanks. Uh, I see we have a question, so, oh, two questions even, so I'm going to pass the mic. Uh, and then I will ask you, because you're talking about the future, and in the future we'll have things. I want to know what is happening right now. But that's... Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daud. Uh, I'm from Indonesia. Um, I'm so glad to join the uh, forum, and I'm so excited to know that there's a special group uh, regarding the public sector. And... Uh, I lead a bus company in my country, and uh, it's the capital city of Indonesia, the Jakarta. The number of citizens is 13 million people, and I operate 3,000 buses, and I serve 1 million passengers a day. So that's about the whole citizen of Phoenix riding a bus every day. So... Um, in the last four years, I increased the number of passengers from 200,000 to 1 million. But the study says if you don't want Jakarta to be famous because of its traffic, you must increase the number of passengers at least to 20 million passengers a day. And I, when I'm, I know we cannot do that manually. We have to uh, adopt one system that can process the humongous data that we have. Um, so, pardon me for this uh, basic question. H how can I uh, start to cooperate with this community to uh, implement the blockchain and where should I start? Thank you. Okay. So, first of all, I think uh, you might be interested in the model when you are talking about the transport sector in Jakarta and you want to make it free from traffic congestion and uh, also serve the people efficiently, you might be interested to look into the Boston model. Uh, Boston had a really good model involving IOTs and AIs to determine the routes, the specific routes through which the bus travels, what is the density of people going through that. So I'm not, you know, jumping into blockchain just to, you know, uh, market blockchain to you. What I'm, you know, trying to position is what exactly might be the precise solution. So here in this case, you might be interested to go ahead with IOTs to determine the density, okay? You can use GPS devices, but that's for commercial individual vehicles. For buses, you need to know how many people exactly boarded the bus, how many people go out of a bus from a specific point. So then you use the AI, okay? Or you use some kind of data model to determine where exactly, you know, you have more density of people because it can't be uniform throughout the city. There are some points where it's high, some points where it goes low. So you have to focus on those specific points where it's high. And uh, the next part will be to, you know, go ahead and increase the number of buses for those specific routes. So that way, at least you can increase the efficiency. Now, where does blockchain fit in this model? So you are generating data from different sources. One part of data is being generated from the IOTs. The other is you are using some sort of AI-based algorithm or some, you are making some data model. Uh, you are, you know, comparing it with some previous data to see that there is authenticity. So you need to store those uh, facts for authentic data from different locations, okay? It need not be the whole data is under your control, okay? The different points from which your buses travel, you may not be the owner of the entire city transport. You are part of that. So it comes, you know, uh, considers the whole city infrastructure. So you will be a contributor to the city infrastructure working on a PPP model because when you are talking about the public, okay, public transport and other stuff, it's a PPP model, public-private partnership model, in which you collaborate with the other service providers and, sure. that, you uh, know... Luckily, in my condition, mm -hmm. uh, my company is uh, government-owned, so I manage all the private sectors in my management. Okay, yeah. wonderful. So in that scenario, you will have data generated uh, from the private uh, bus owners as well as uh, you might have some government-owned buses as well, right? Yes. Okay, so data is generated from multiple sources here because you want to give some flexibility, some degree of control as part of, you know, 
a democratic system or process to those individual owners. And there has to be a consensus. It's not you are imposing something, but you are going on a co-creation, value creation model. So whatever data is being you know, generated, those are immutable data. You store the specific value points, and from that, your strategies to work to figure out what basically works for them. So blockchain works at the back end on the specific piece, on the decision-making process, on the specific critical data inputs. And the large volumes of data is basically managed by the AIs, which are generated by the IoT devices at different points, pickup points, drop points, and kind of stuff. So it's an integrated infrastructure, as I see right now, from a high level, IoT plus AI plus blockchain, a potential area where you might think into a POC or maybe kind of a research study to you know, move on. If, if, if I could just add, well, well done, by the way. A, a million customers a day <laughs> yeah. is pretty amazing. And I like, Saptarshi, what you said, um, which we are seeing more and more today, which is that blockchain is just a piece of that uh, puzzle. Um, it's not like you will build a blockchain-based uh, um, bus services or something like that. It has to be integrated with the whole solution. And I think that's what we are seeing in a lot of the uh, use cases that uh, that we've uh, we've heard from. Uh, I think you had a question, right? Uh, this question is for Sean. You were mentioning um, the example of real estate this idea of in the future we could have uh, transactions taking place in one day. Uh, what are the major barriers uh, to making that happen? Is it uh, from a technical standpoint or is it a regulation that is, is holding back that uh, development? Um, so, and, and my estimate of a day is, is the theory, um, whether or not we'll actually get there. I, I'm pretty certain I'm 100% I'm certain we can shorten it from the 60, I said 30, 60, even 90 days in some cases. We could shorten that. Um, uh, but whether or not it's actually a day, I'm just, you know, anyway. But um, it, it, so the barriers are, um, I think you have a few layers of barriers, uh, but I think part of it's collaboration. Um, and we're, we were gonna get into some of this later, some of the challenges and barriers in general, but you have collaborative challenges and then funding challenges. Um, so, uh, w one common theme that for anyone working in the blockchain space in general, not just public sector, is around collaboration and cooperation. Um, it, you have all these entities that are transacting in the marketplace, and then you have governments that are overseeing those transactions. Um, and getting all of those parties to work together uh, for the things that are that that benefit them collectively is I think there's there's a lot of work to be done around that so in this case the real estate transaction um, you have all of those parties that I mentioned you have you know real estate firms real estate agents um, you've got the lenders you've got title insurance and 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 so on and so forth so getting cooperation among all of those market participants on top of cooperation from the, the government's uh, entities that provide oversight in those transactions is um, there's, there's quite a bit of coordination that, that still needs to happen. So the technology, I think, is, is still emerging. Um, I think there, you know, as, as frameworks like Hyperledger continue to, to develop and mature um, along with Ethereum uh, uh, and, and the ability to create smart contracts, um, the, the technology, I think, is maturing, so it's part of it, but that's not the only part. I think it's, there's a cooperative piece there that um, is, is going to require um, folks to really kind of see the value. If I can jump in here, I actually think that human aspect is the most challenging part of any blockchain solution. It's, we, we have no problems with technology, but it's humans that we have problems with. Uh, sorry, there are quite a few questions, so I'm going to go... First, second, third, fourth. <laughs> yeah, mainly in the real estate sector, you just brought out the challenges you have. So I, you, you already said just now that the technology is not the problem here. So are you considering, or probably the states that are considering moving towards that, and what are the actions you guys are taking in this case if you're from a public sector? Um, so I'll give one brief comment, then I'll probably turn it over to, to these guys. But 
So, to be clear, I'm, I've, I've, you know, I'm no longer in the public sector. I, I was there until uh, through last summer. Um, and so what's under consideration currently that um, I think I'm, I'm no more informed on it than any other citizen. But having been in government for a couple of years, uh, I certainly, um, I certainly uh, was, an, was an advocate for these ideas and really try to push to, um, to move some of these ideas forward. So, um, but currently in, in my current role, uh, like I was saying, I'm, I'm CTO of a reg tech company. So the, um, uh, and 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 the, this company operates in 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 the, the healthcare space uh, primarily. So there, there's there's all kinds of needs for traceability and identity in in, in that space as well. Um, but I, I do know in general, uh, different governments around the world are looking at leveraging blockchain for real estate transactions. Um, but I'll, I'll let I'll let these guys kind of talk about specific examples. Hi, I'm just going to mention the example in um, Dubai, Smart Dubai City. Um, the way that they took the approach is they look at everything as a journey. So a real estate transaction would be a journey, and all the participants in the circle are part of that journey and buy into that. And I think they have 57 journeys that um, a citizen can take. And again, they had the buy-in of the government to put the grid on a blockchain so that everyone knows whose property is owned by who. Again, that identity piece, identity piece comes first. Um, so again, Dubai, because the government is so involved, is much further than most other places. Uh, I just would like to add one more example neighboring Dubai. It's uh, Abu Dhabi. So Abu Dhabi has its uh, you know, smart services, uh, kind of an e-government services, where it offers more than 100 e-government services to its people. So Tech Mahindra has recently partnered with the land you know, department of uh, Abu Dhabi where it is responsible for uh, taking care of the leasing contracts, rental agreements and other kind of stuff because more than three quarter of the total population of UAE are non-Emirati, which means they are not local guys. They may not be Arabic guys, they may be coming from India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, other countries, okay? So for work or other purposes. So maintaining the you know, legal requirements of rental agreements, lease documents, and other kind of stuff are pretty complicated. So they have partnered with Tech Mahindra and they are going to use Hyperledger Fabric for this specific purpose. And it's going to be a pilot project and we're looking forward to some, you know, some viable results pretty soon. Thank you. Yes, exact name of the division is not, you know, popping up on my head, the specific entity. So um, we're talking about public record keeping. And um, one of the reasons we've trusted public record keeping is because we've had registries, we've had public archives, where we know that the authenticity, the integrity can be preserved over the long term and we can always go back and it's authoritative and we can access it. So um, with these projects that you've mentioned, what are they doing to think about long-term preservation of the authenticity of the public records uh, and archiving? I'll chime in with a couple of, of comments there. So um, I think as everybody knows, I mean, government is part of the big value proposition of the, of the blockchain technology in general is trust, right? And so, um, and so gov the validation of government in certain transactions is a part of the public trusting in in those that those transactions were legitimate and followed the, the rules that needed to be followed um, and so the uh, so you see that over and over and over again with with uh, vital vital records and land records and which is I think you know certainly part part of what you're referring to um, and so so government has the mechanisms to to drive truth right they have subpoena power they have um, you, you know people can be can can be uh, um, put under um, uh, legal requirement to tell the truth in, in in terms of what happened so from that perspective government will always have a um, will always have the mechanisms to really require the truth um, where other entities uh, um, may not necessarily have that direct power. Um, and so for that reason, government is 
uh, I think will play a vital role in terms of validating and verifying information that is, um, if, if we're talking about blockchain, validating and verifying information that is being proposed to be written to a certain blockchain. Um, there is an open question though about whether or not government, and I think there's different points of view on this, whether or not government is the owner and operator of a blockchain or set of blockchains, or whether or not it's really just a participant that, that participates in validating transactions. And that's still very much, I think, of an open debate um, in, in, in the community in general. So I'll stop there with those general comments, but I don't know if you guys have anything to add. Uh, I just have one potential uh, research works or a use case you might be interested, NARA, the National Archival Records Agency in US. So they are trying to achieve something with blockchain. Exact details I'm not able to recollect right now, but certainly they are pretty much interested in uh, retaining the critical information, the data which may be 20 years, 30 years, or even 50 years old, so, and which may be required in future as well for some specific purposes. So we might be happy to share with you those specific facts on NARA, or you can check that out. Thank you. Um, just two quick comments. One, Sean, I failed to meet your 24-hour criteria for real estate close. I took 32 hours uh, from start to finish. Uh, after a that, 90 That's also well done. After a 90-day failure following traditional methods, the key to making it 32 hours was showing up with cash for everybody. And everybody says, no, we're not going to. So that got the ultimate level of cooperation out of all parties. But the one point on real estate that was obvious is title insurance. Um, the second you have, in a sense, validated documents to prove you own this plot of land and uh, this, this plot belongs to you and this structures on it also belong to you, once you have those documents and then you have a chain of custody going forward, you actually never need title insurance. That, that's correct. And that's a... A little fun fact that most people I don't I think fully realize that if um, you, that that the the title insurance companies when you wonder what they actually do, they they actually are validating public records. My right. Title insurance <laughs> well, more so, right. So that's what they're doing. They're they're you're you're paying insurance for them to validate information that's available to everybody publicly. Correct. Right. So my other point uh, is there's a general question on government records, which is who audits the auditors? So if the government's the auditors, who audits them? And the answer is I do. Um, so in the state of Massachusetts, um, accident information is pretty important, kind of like real estate information, right? Because you plan, uh, it impacts safety, which impacts highway funding and all that kind of stuff. It impacts insurance rates, all kinds of stuff. And so as part of uh, a project for Plymouth, Massachusetts, we were looking at some uh, highway projects and they were quoting state records on accident history. And so uh, they were all government records that were official police reports and stuff like that. So I actually went to the state, actually pulled the records myself, looked at them, went through them, and found out 40% of the accident records reported in that area of Massachusetts for those 10 years were completely wrong. 60% were right, 40% were wrong. So I went back to the source data, basically had the state and the police departments correct their records. But a lot of times we assume those records are accurate when they're not. And so the, the real issue is, how do you validate records properly to begin with so that you can, back to your point, be sure that the government is reporting the truth to the best of its ability, which and, is and a challenge. No, and that's a great point. And it, it actually gets to a larger concept around what, um, what it means to reach consensus on a blockchain. That's really kind of what you're getting at. So consensus comes from any number of sources. Um, and, and so there's, there's, there's a whole sort of larger conversation there around how you achieve consensus. But um, what all I'm saying is that, and you're right, just because government's involved doesn't mean it's actually validating, what they're doing is actually accurate. Um, it, it, they can certainly make mistakes too, but it's a, it's a point of validation among a larger uh, community of validators of a certain transaction. Um, I'm wondering, and that's a question a bit of a, to, to the entire panel, whether there uh, doesn't exist a specific something like a meta use case for the public sector. Uh, there is a project in, by the European Commission which started in 2016 called the European Financial Transparency Gateway. 
Um, and it basically comes or stems from the Transparency Directive, which requires listed companies to uh, report annual reports and all these kind of pieces of information to uh, registries in each of the 27, well, right now 27 member states. Um, and uh, these registries, well, they could be private registries, private sector, they could be public sector or, or something in, be in between. Uh, they disagree to put this data into uh, a common database for various reasons, political, operational, and so on. So the commission came up with the idea to establish a layer on top uh, via blockchain, just give each of them as becoming part of the nodes, give them the wallets, and record only not really the information itself that they receive from the listed companies, but actually just the fact that they received this piece of information. And that created something like an index, something like a search engine that you could basically look across. This is part of the low. So the question is to the panel, have you stumbled upon any similar use cases where connection of the different pieces or, or, or registries would create value for users and, and, and would justify the use of blockchain? So you're looking forward to the you know, interoperability or connections between the different organizations or you know, the information about different, you know, registrations about kind of stuff, right? Yes, that might be. So, I hope you might be interested on the VON, the Orgbook uh, British Columbia, Orgbook BC, which is based on Hyperledger Indy. Initially, they did a POC on Hyperledger Fabric, then they moved into Hyperledger Indy, and uh, they are creating, you know, a great job. They have got a production environment solution, uh, as well as the, you know, provincial government of Ontario, they have also done something similar to that. So all the business registrations of those particular states, you can access now the authentic information when they are registered, if they have any license and permits and other kind of stuff. Uh, you don't need to wait for a long time. In a fraction of a second, few seconds, you'll be able to check out if they are legitimate entities operating out of this country, sorry, this province, like say, British Columbia or Ontario, and what kind of license or permits they hold. And uh, that's something they are trying to you know, evolve and go ahead further. And the next thing I remember of the uh, Kerala Blockchain Academy, KBA in India. So they are also trying to do something on that lines, following the model of VON, that is the Verifiable Organization Network. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we run out of time. Uh, so as a conclusion, I'm going to tell you a couple of things that you might want to follow up with. Uh, we didn't get into the uh, sustainable development goals and what is happening uh, in different governments around SDGs, but uh, all three of our, our panelists are here. Now you know their faces and their names, so go chase them during the booth crawl or tomorrow in our dude ranch or wherever else you want to do it. I'm sure they will be thrilled to, to talk to you about it. Uh, additionally, we will have... Uh, presentations from um, IROHA uh, or Soramitsu team on uh, the project Bekong, which is uh, creating a digital currency from the, C uh, the uh, central bank, uh, so central digital currency. That's uh, tomorrow at, I believe, 11. There is also a presentation from Kiwa on what they've been doing with Sierra Leone, also tomorrow around 11.40. You'll have to check the schedule. And indeed, John Jordan is also doing a presentation, I forget when, but uh, you can find him. And if you want to meet uh, John Jordan or anybody else in this space, come to me and I'm gonna introduce you to it. So thank you so much um, to all three of you. Thank you for participating and um, I'll see you around.